There's huge energy because let's face it, the teachers unions, uh, uh, they done messed up. Uh, uh, they shut down schools. They were masking kindergartners. They were trying to get kids vac vaccinated against the scientific evidence. They're, and at the same time, pushing critical race theory, pushing radical gender theory. Um, um, this is a historic generational opportunity for change on that issue. And I Welcome back to the Kevin Roberts Show. You know, all of our guests are great. I don't think all of them have the energy that this week's guest has. So you are in for a fast paced wide-ranging conversation, even accounting for my Gulf Coast accent. So all of that to say, my friend of several years, senior fellow at Manhattan Institute and great American, Chris Rufo. Thanks for being here. It's good to be with you. How's life? Life is good. Yeah, life is good. It's um, We're kind of rolling down from this midterms. And for me, just because of the rhythm of politics, that's always a time to kind of reflect and readjust and think about uh, you know what what I could personally do better, what what conservatives can do better. So um, I, I, I like that. I like that period of reflection. You know, you have this like frenzy of activity, and you're hustling on things. So it's good to take a time to reflect, and um, and I imagine you've been doing the same thing. I have uh, coming back from as I mentioned. I think it's okay. I can say this publicly. Pheasant hunting. And That's right. For heritage supporters, it was a work trip. But to your point, it's it's all kidding aside. It's really important that we take the time to reflect, and it has been frenzied. And we weren't planning to talk about this, but the whole point of the show is not to plan to talk about something sure. in particular, that I, I get the sense that the conservative movement, especially after the election, and especially after a recent battle in Congress that Heritage was part of, is really fatigued. Yeah. And one of my concerns moving forward, it's not a worry because I think this will be overcome. One of my concerns is for us, especially at holiday time, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, that we take the time to rest up for the battles ahead. And you're really good at doing that. That's one of the things I've learned about you over the years. Any secrets before we get into the kind of policy <laughs> steps about that? Oh, you know, I, I don't know. I, th I think it's it's family. I have a great uh, family, wife and kids. And so anytime that I need to recharge, that's kind of where I go to get my energy worked up and uh, but um, but my wife would always say, you, you don't rest enough. You know, you're always go, 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 go. I, I can't, I have a kind of compulsion on it um, because what we're doing is important. You know, that's, that's the thing that I, I wake up every day feeling is what I'm doing matters. And I didn't always feel that way. I spent time in my previous career in the documentary business. I would wake up every day thinking, does what I do matter? And having this sneaking suspicion that it didn't. Um, so being involved in politics is just is great because there's no sort of there's never a shortage of problems um, and that means there are never uh, there's never a shortage for leadership solutions new ideas policies journalism everything um, th the question is where to allocate your time and uh, and this is a, a period where I'm trying to kind of reallocate and my, my big takeaway from the midterms if, if we're thinking in those terms is the the kind of silver lining the bright spot for me was courage and competence. It seems like the people who could demonstrate those those values of courage and competence. So uh, people that were taking on big issues courageously, uh, and then people, especially that were running for office that that demonstrated competent governance, um, whether they were you know governors or whether they were uh, state legislators, seemed to win, um, whereas uh, uh, that wasn't true across the board. And so I always think, okay, well, how can I redial in to, 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 to really focusing on that is you've got to be substantive. You've got to move the ball forward in a meaningful way. You have to speak to about the issues that really matter to people, but you also have to do it in a way that's not just culture war for culture war's sake. You have to do it in, in culture war that is going to improve people's lives. Um, and so for me, working on some of the most more hot button issues, it's a really good reminder of what the purpose of, of that is for. Why are we doing this? How can we actually not just drive attention about CRT or gender ideology, but how can we actually protect people who feel really besieged by those those ideologies? Yeah, and those, these first couple of points we've landed on are very connected. The, the first point about taking some time to reflect after the election, both from the standpoint of resting up for the next fights, but also for the for the mental intellectual time to think about what the priorities and strategies need to be in the future that's crucial but it's connected to what you said in analyzing the election you didn't mention names but immediately to me what what th those who come to mind are DeSantis in Florida Kemp in Georgia 
Abbott in Texas, another governor who happens to be a friend as well, Governor Kevin Stitt of Oklahoma. Yeah. These are all not just conservative leaders, but conservative leaders who are articulate, who have been willing to be engaged in some of these issues that we will talk about in depth momentarily, gender ideology, critical race theory. But even beyond that, beyond a willingness to engage in the culture war and doing so smartly and thinking about building a political coalition, they're also extremely competent managers of their states. And it's the, I'm with you on the silver lining. We spend a lot of time thinking, even complaining about the fact that the American Republic might be in its last days. Who knows? As I tell people, we still have to fight, even if we're in the last yeah. paragraph of the last chapter of the Republic. I'm going down fighting. I know you are too. Mm -hmm. the, the point is, the, the good news is that Americans still value competent leadership. That ought to be a lesson for us yeah. as conservatives, right? I, I, it, it absolutely is, and I think those governors that that you mentioned are, are are demonstrating that, and and I think that there's a certain portion of people with whom I usually a, a agree uh, that that are we have to be more hard charging, we have to be more aggressive, we have to be kind of more. Um, uh, uh, inflammatory in some ways, and and I personally agree. I, I have no problem with that. I've noticed, but that I'm a media figure. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different rules. Uh, these guys, people, voters need to feel like their leaders are competent executives, and so the personality is going to be quite different. You know, one of the things that I've noticed too, some a governor like Doug Ducey, um, you know, who who, get, who gets heat from the base, which I, in some ways I don't understand because uh, Governor Ducey is a principled conservative. Uh, he passed the ban on CRT. Uh, he got universal school choice, the first governor in the country to actually get that long stand, you know, decades long policy objective actually accomplished. Um, he's putting the uh, shipping containers on the border. I mean. He, from a policy perspective, he's doing everything right. There's some grumbling among folks, including friends of mine. Oh, Doug Ducey is, is, is this and that. But I always think, what did he get done? And then, you know, he, win, he won his last election uh, in, in, in 2018 by a large margin. And so I think that people are, 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 are right to try to hold politicians' feet to the fire. But I think we should really be careful in evaluating their work based on what are they actually delivering and getting done. And it seems like the politicians that are capable, competent, substantive, delivering an agenda, like DeSantis in Florida is the, kind of the prime example, are rewarded by voters. So we shouldn't fall into despair because I think that actually the solution, the answer is really right there in front of us. Um, but it takes a, a bit of self-discipline, a bit of restraint, a bit of those other qualities um, that we have to balance with that passion and aggression and, and, and fight. What an excellent point. You know, Governor Ducey was a fairly recent guest on this show, and I was struck by a couple of things. The, the first was, although he didn't use the word, I, I guess it's just the, uh, the, the sports fanatic in me, it, it's about the scoreboard. Yeah. And when you look at what he did in his two terms as governor of Arizona, we would be hard pressed to find another governorship in the last half century that was as successful. But the second thing was his humility. Yeah. And, and, and American voters across the political spectrum, you know, maybe not on the radical left, but maybe even some of them really respect that. Yeah. And I think it's a lesson for us, especially knowing that this election cycle was less successful than those of us who do policy, those of us like you who are, are leaders in the media wanted, that we have to be focused on an aspirational vision that's based in policy substance. Yeah. I, I, I agree, and I think that that is something that I'm certainly trying to work on and to try to think of how can we actually translate this tremendous energy on our side um, and, 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 in, and in very justified outrage, but translate it into something Conse something consequential, something that really is meaningful for people. And I think, you know, and, and, and Governor Ducey is, I mean, he, 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 he kind of made his fortune running an ice cream <laughs> business. I mean, he's a nice guy. Um, he's a humble guy. He's a person you can really talk to uh, uh, over lunch and really uh, have a, a, a meaningful exchange. And I think that uh, his record really shows, and I'm hoping that he spends some time uh, uh, working with other governors, other legislators to kind of share some of his wisdom. And and I, I followed the school choice vote quite closely, did some reporting on it. And, and, and it's also, what are the mechanics of government? How do you get your own coalition on board? How do you, how do you get legislation uh, through? And I think too often, and maybe the lesson uh, of this election cycle is, um, 
that gets a bit lost. It gets lost in some of the the more surface level spectacle. Um, and you know, spectacle is a perfect word. And, and, and look, I love the spectacle. I, I I love the spectacle. I respect the spectacle. Uh, you often generate. Uh, I, the spectacle. I, I generate the spectacle. The spectacle is my business, uh, uh, in in a lot of ways. But uh, I I think that um, the spectacle vanishes uh, uh, quickly, um, and you have to tether it to something deeper, um, and that's kind of the 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 the, the real trick. Uh, that I try to do don't always don't always do it perfectly don't always do it do it right but always try to say how can you capture the spectacle and then immediately anchor it into something that is more robust more meaningful more substantive um, and so how can you catch the headline on something salacious which is again my stock and trade I I, I don't feel like it, like it's uh, I think it's 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 how the world works uh, and I think it's good in many ways to be able to generate that but then say and this is where you should go f- with it because we don't want conservatives to feel outrage that can, then gets internalized. That's when you feel despair. That's when you have even some conservatives. Uh, America is a bad country. Are you seeing this? I'm seeing these uh, places. Profoundly. And America is, is an awful country. I'm not proud to be an American. It's like we have, to, it, we have to take those people back from the abyss. That's a dangerous place to go. Um, and so we have to take people, hey, there are big, big problems, but then we have to lead them. Uh, towards some positive vision. It's dangerous politically. It's dangerous socially because people get really isolated. This is a problem yeah. with with young men of, of all ethnic backgrounds. And it's also a problem spiritually. And and so there's nothing good that can come from that despair. And and I think the the connection between the level of despair that a lot of conservatively minded Americans feel with the spectacle in the bad sense of the phrase. By that, I mean elected leaders or people who want to be elected leaders talking about issues, framing them in ways that really is spectacular, but missing substance was rejected this cycle. And not every friend on the right is going to want to hear that assessment from me, (laughs) but it happens to be true. I, I, I agree, yeah. And I always I feel you want to approach our own coalition delicately, right? And respectfully. But I mean, that that really is the lesson. And uh, I, I think, too, some of the issues that people focused on in the ele- in, in this election cycle were not important for voters. Um, and I think that, uh, look, uh, winning is important. You know, the, the point is to win. So you, take back you, America. Uh, we got to win elections. You got to win elections. And so, so what is actually working with, for, for people? What is actually working in, in the arena? Uh, and it, it are, are two important questions that I think were answered by voters. And I think that someone like Ron DeSantis in Florida, for me, uh, I've had the chance to work with the governor and his team on a number of issues and policy proposals. I mean, he, he dials in the uh, kind of culture war fight and the public policy fight in a really brilliant way. This is uh, uh, someone who um, is also has a mind for public policy. And uh, guess what? That actually helps. Uh, It helps to actually know and care about the policy. Uh, You know, I know I I, I wrote a recent op-ed and, you know, traveled with him to introduce the Stop Woke Act, kind of controversial, uh, but I think important legislation. And he shows up at the tarmac with a Red Bull uh, and a stack of policy papers. And I said, this is my guy. Like, this is uh, this is fantastic. This is what I like to see, someone, you know, reading policy papers in, on the plane in the morning. And 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 I think that the the voters rewarded him overwhelmingly because he's done he's done things that uh, he's look, he's not above the spectacle. Uh, and none of us are. Um but he always then delivers for his people, for his voters, uh, and is extremely competent. The hurricane response, counting all the votes within a few hours, uh, you know, who would have thought? Uh, 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 delivering on this kind of anti-woke agenda, not just by generating headlines, but by actually passing bills through the legislature to protect people from racial scapegoating in the workplace, from divisive and pseudoscientific ideologies in the classroom, saying, hey, you know what, we don't want to have uh, be teaching kids about uh, pansexuality in kindergarten. Um, we're not going to do that in Florida. And I think that um, that ability to wage culture war as public policy it, it is such a model for the way forward. Um, and ultimately, uh, uh, we have to serve people. We have to serve voters. We have to serve families. We have to serve uh, kids that live in public institutions. Um, and, and, and you have to make things better. 
And it's almost like going back to the very basics. What is the point of, what is the purpose of government? It's, well, it's to protect people's rights. And uh, in a more kind of positivist sense, it's to make their lives better. And as conservatives, we could say, well, the government, uh, the government shouldn't be involved in that. You know, there's a kind of principled, maybe libertarian argument. But look, the government employs 24 million people in the United States. The government controls 90% 90, 90 of K through 12 education, 75% of higher education. Um, it essentially runs the HR departments of every Fortune 100 corporation. That's not going to be reversed overnight. We have to figure out how to make those institutions better for people. And a lot of that is really just offering people protection from abuses. Um, and I think the, the, the leaders that are actually doing that, actually delivering for people, are the ones that are being rewarded. So let's look forward using, using that point, whether it's combating gender ideology, critical race theory, other emerging concerns. What are, the, what are the tactics? What's the messaging that you would suggest to someone thinking about running for office in the next election cycle? Well, I'll, I'll give you a good example back in Arizona, which we've been talking about. I, I loved Kerry Lake. I loved Blake Masters. Blake Masters was probably my, my favorite Senate candidate of the cycle. I spoke at a fundraiser for him here in D.C. Um, uh, and so it was sad to see them lose. Uh, 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 but there was another guy who ran for state superintendent of education, Tom Horn. I met him at an anti-CRT event a year ago. He's an older guy, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, eccentric, uh, but deeply conservative. He understand, he and he ran a simple campaign. I'm, I'm sure he had no budget uh, against an incumbent superintendent. He said no CRT, no DEI, um, uh, um, and, and no kind of racialist ideology in education. That was his platform, and he won. He won a statewide race in Arizona with, with, with no money, a very simple message. Um, and so I, I think that um, the, the way forward is to connect the issues to people. First of all, you have to make that connection, figure out where the energy is, um, and then propose constructive agenda. And what I'm working on personally, and, 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 and maybe selfishly I should say, politicians should adopt my agenda, is, is to actually say, hey, look, what have we learned about these fights? Well, we've learned that these issues are important to voters. We've learned that they want solutions, but we've also learned that um, we've only had a small dent on this stuff. The big institutions of this country are captured. I, I think there's really no way around it. The evidence is overwhelming. So we need to have a, a, a way to say, wait a minute, we don't want this anti-democratic revolution from above where people come in through the DEI department, nobody voted for this, uh, even, in the, even in government, and they impose left-wing ideology on people and then kids in school um, without their consent, without their vote, without even uh, a, a kind of affirmative legislative program. Uh, these are bureaucratic coups, anti-democratic at their core. We need to restore the democratic function to say, hey, look, people don't want this. We're now going to, to legislate uh, to protect people from things that they don't want. And we're going to actually start reforming the institutions. And so I think we need ambitious institutional reform. And conservatives need to really realize we're, we're on the outside. Uh, uh, you know, we're on the outside of the institutions, whether it's the K through 12 school bureaucracy, the federal bureaucracy, um, but even corporate HR departments, which really shape the culture in, in Fortune 100 companies um, that are just as woke as, you know, sociology departments uh, in many cases. And so we have to figure out how to wage an outside in fight against these institutions. And what I think that is important to understand is it's a political question that requires legislative solutions. This is gonna be a departure from some of our more purist libertarian friends and allies, but these are no longer uh, uh, libertarian concerns. These are mon government monopolies, government uh, uh, kind of oligopolies, uh, or kind of government captured bureaucracies. And so this is fair domain, even under libertarian principles, for regulation, for, for protecting people, for reshaping how these institutions work. And so that's going to require, though, new thinking from policy makers and policy thinkers. Um, it's going to require us to, 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 to think about uh, policy in a new way and, to, and to, to, to develop policy ideas that tackle the problem from a totally new angle. So it's going to require creativity. It's going to requ require us 
our, our own movement of over, overcoming uh, our own kind of habits and maybe biases. Um, and it's going to require a, a more activist orientation towards these problems. There's no, there's no defeating the capture of America's public institutions uh, by appealing to the past. We actually have to fight this fight moving into the future. Back when I was a professional full-time historian and studying and teaching military history in part, among other things, the, the, the worst generals, pick your war, pick your country, were those who were applying non-transferable lessons from the last war to the current war. America made that mistake. There are civil war generals on both sides, the Union and the Confederacy, who made that mistake. But it's also true in politics. And, and I say this not only respectfully of all of us in the movement, but also understanding that here I am, the president of Heritage, You know, we, we can also up our game, so to speak. I think every institution on the right needs to. But to say, we actually honor the past. We honor our victories in the last political wars. We honor the successes of the past political fights by adapting to the circumstances of the day. And one of the reasons I've been intrigued by your work and very supportive over the years since we first met several years ago in the AEI Leadership Network has been that you recognize, as our friends on the new right like to say, what time it is in America. Yeah. And, and what time it is for us as conservatives is for us to recognize not just that we need to be on offense, not just that we need to be more comfortable with generating the spectacle in order to have policy change, but that the policy solutions themselves are going to look differently, not unmoored from our principles, in fact, quite the opposite, very moored to our principles, but in terms of the specifics of the legislation and the level of activism by conservatives in power, as we've seen by DeSantis in Florida most notably, that's the future. All of that to say, Chris, What's what's one piece of legislation, or you know maybe two, if you want to speak at length, and and if you can get into specifics that you think conservatives have the opportunity to rally around as we go into legislative sessions in 2023? Well, look, legislative sessions in 2023 are going to be driven by state legislatures. Yep. Uh, I don't think any good legislation is going to happen uh, here in D.C. Um, but look, I, I think the time is now. The most important priority, I think, is the universal school choice bills. Uh, I think Iowa is likely to get something done. I'm hoping that Texas also, I'm hearing rumblings in Texas. We're very something active will there. Get, something will get done. Um, because the, 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 the principles don't change. Uh, they're eternal, uh, if, if, you, if you believe, uh, I think, like we do. Uh, but the strategies and tactics change, and the principles have to be reinterpreted for each generation, or else they grow stale. They're not actually meaning for pe meaningful for people. Uh, but I think that the conservative principle on universal school choice is very simple. It's breaking up centralized ideological and administrative power, the K-12 school bureaucracies, and, and pushing power, decision-making, and money in, down to the lowest possible level following the principle of subsidiarity, decentralizing power and money, and then saying to parents, hey, you know what? If you don't like what's happening in your public school, as Arizona's done, we'll give you $7,000 a year per child, which is the average tuition rate for private schools, um, that you can take anywhere, public school or charter school, private school, religious school, homeschool, uh, anywhere you want, because we trust you. And then that's going to create a market for alternatives that is going to create a, a lot of happy people in a more pluralistic and complex and, and layered, textured social fabric. And so there's huge energy because, let's face it, the teachers unions, uh, uh, they done messed up. Uh, uh, they shut down schools. They were masking kindergartners. They were trying to get kids vac vaccinated against the scientific evidence, They're, and at the same time pushing critical race theory, pushing radical gender theory. Um, um, this is a historic generational opportunity for change on that issue. And I think that it really is going to uh, improve things for everyone, including the public schools. It's, gonna, it's going to uh, force them to compete. It's going to force them to be more responsive to parents. Um, and, you know, I, I have kids, I know you have kids that are later in school, um, but this is something that really, I mean, it, it's at the, the heart of the human experience, what it means to be a parent, what it means to be a family, where you send your kids uh, to get their education. Um, and, and I just think that to me is a model that can be replicated elsewhere, um, but it's a big win that people can put on the board, you know, next year. It can really happen. And I think that will open up so many other avenues uh, for reform. 
So let's let's switch a little bit. It's very related, but from the political or policy realm to the individual realm, what I like to call the sidewalk level. And the everyday Americans thinking, okay, I can go talk to my state legislator about universal school choice. They need to do that. But we also need to, I think as a movement, be better at explaining how to encourage conservatives to have different behavior as it relates to the institutions in their lives. And I have become very hostile, openly hostile, to most institutions of this country, perhaps evidenced by the fact that I've started a K-12 through school because I didn't think the Catholic schools in my town were worth anything, theologically or academically. And as a result of that school opening, I'm not trying to take credit for this, the faculty should, the other schools are starting to improve. And secondly, leading an upstart new Catholic college for the same reason. All of that to say, I've become enamored with the idea that there are many institutions in this country that just need to fail. And the hard part for us as conservatives, because we we honor the past, we honor the people and the ideas in the institutions that cultivated us, is to recognize that about our alma maters. It's a long-winded way of asking you this question. Do conservatives, as they adopt this more activist stance relative to policy, also need to be more activist when it comes to kicking the bad institutions into the sea and leaving them behind? They do. And the alma mater question is something that just boggles my mind. I talk to people all the time that say, oh, yeah, I gave you know $50 million to my alma mater. It's like, but why would you do that? You know, the or you know, I gave two million dollars to open up a, a whatever at my old you know university. It's like conservative donors, people that have been successful in business, um, have to realize that their alma mater is today very different than the one they graduated from, and in, in you know. 62 or whatever it may be. Um, and so they have to get smart about giving. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity here uh, uh, that, 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 that you've embodied, you've done, is to say, you know what, maybe uh, uh, you know, your, your, your Yale uh, doesn't need any more money. Uh, and maybe actually they're going to put your money to bad use. What about um, actually channeling the entrepreneurial sense? And this is a, a kind of conservative principle, free market principle that is still really quite meaningful is we have to be builders. We have to be founders. Um, we have to not just be builders and founders in business, but also, also in our cultural institutions, our educational institutions. And we should be taking, uh, 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 making bold investments in new institutions that can just by existing shift everything around them. Um, and, I, I, and I see a, a huge, this, the, the, the most exciting thing that I see on that front today is in education. You have the classical school movement that is, uh, it's, it's exciting. There's a classical school in my area in, in kind of small town Washington state. And I saw their high school, um, their high school curriculum. It's, you know, uh, uh, you know, medieval history, European history, American history, four years of Latin, uh, you know. I, I mean, it's, it's this really great kind of s scooping up classical education and, and, and giving new life to those eternal principles. But what's just as exciting is that it's a startup school, uh, uh, you know, with, with, you know, only two, two years, they're kind of growing into it. But it's because it's responding to a hunger out there. And, and I think of my own life experience. I went to public school in California. Uh, no complaints, good public schools. Uh, well, some complaints, but, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, good public schools. But I, I, I look back and I feel like I was, in some sense, uh, uh, um, uh, um, there was a huge hole in it. And it was, well, I didn't read the great books. I didn't, what was the, what was the, this kind of mushy, almost non-ideology. It was like ideology that was so banal. It was like, what did I even learn? What was the content? What was the substance? Um, and, 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 and I think we're seeing that everywhere. It's like, nobody believes in DEI. Nobody believes in, in CRT besides the people that are professionally incentivized to believe it. Um, some people believe in the gender ideology, but most people don't. Um, but we're not giving people an alternative. We have to very clearly say, we're against CRT, but we're for this. And we're gonna actually create institutions that, that, that where you can get this thing. Um, uh, it's classical schools, it's uh, um, something that has uh, 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 magnetism. We have to create a magnetic movement 
and magnetic institutions, at the same time we're waging war. Uh, on the on the ones that do need to fail, and magnetic leaders are part of that, and, yeah. n- and not just political leaders, all of whom have been in, in the news naturally because we just completed an election cycle, but institutional leaders. Uh, one of the things that makes me very optimistic about the future is the classical schools movement across all all faiths. You yeah. know, from from Orthodox Jews to Evangelical Protestants to the world that I know well, Catholic classical schools, but also that we're forming new heads of school mm-hmm. because when when I was leaving the school that that I founded in Louisiana to, to become the president of the small college in Wyoming, the biggest fear that we had was we've luckily found a great successor, but for other schools like ours, what are the sources of those? Because just to put a fine point on this, I think it's probably true that you need to take every college of education in this country, select all, delete, and start over. <laughs> And this is from a fifth-generation teacher. But the good news is that we now have, just in the last decade, at least four or five new training programs for classical teachers and for heads of school. That's that's the point you're making about leaning into building institutions. Yes. Not wasting time and energy, money on institutions that have already failed us because the left has concluded, they have successfully concluded their long march through our institutions. I, 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 I 100% agree. And look, cr- creative destruction is the, the reality that inevitably happens and has to happen. And you have to manage it in a way that that leads towards something better. Um, we need some destruction. Uh, there are institutions that need to be destroyed. I think uh, graduate schools of education are one of them. I think you could actually wipe them out uh, by just... Uh, uh, changing teacher licensing uh, laws. Uh, there's some ways where you could kind of reduce the. Uh, they, I mean, they have a cart. They're a cartel. You have to get the credential. You have to do this. You're required to to do that. Um, it's not free market. It's not. It's not a uh, 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 anything that we should support in any way. It's also abysmal education. Oh, I mean, abysmal. It's so bad. Yeah. It, I mean, it's it's you know the number one assigned book is Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. You know. Brazilian Marxist who called the Chinese Cultural Revolution, you know, the most genial solution of the century. You know, murdering and and displacing millions of people in the name of communism uh, 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 is is the uh, the kind of cornerstone text uh, in American graduate schools of education, uh, which which most people I think would be surprised to hear. But you're going to have kids. You need to have educators. You need to have headmasters. You need to have administrators that are capable people. So let's let's create those alternatives. And then the more controversial sense, but something that I'm convinced and I'm trying to make the argument is, you also need to create patronage networks. And uh, let's face it, the government spends a lot of money. The government, whether you like it or not, will spend a lot of money next year. Why don't we shift that money towards good things rather than bad things? I, I'm trying to say it in as simple a way as possible. And I think universal school choice, again, it's a, it's a, a voucher. It's a, a government subsidy for families. Um, uh, in, in a pure free market sense, you could say, yeah, I have friends say, well, the government should have no place in education at all. That's not going to happen. So let's subsidize good things uh, and, 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 and create negative incentives towards bad things. Um, this is something we have to get maybe more comfortable with and do it judiciously, do it wisely. Um, but, but look, right now we subsidize almost all bad things. And then we're surprised that things are, are, are not going well. Um, we have to update that. And state governments that are closest to those institutions, that are closest to the people, local governments too, um, should say, how do we reorient the, the state, which exists and will exist? How do we reorient our public institutions towards supporting uh, 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 the values and principles that the voters want, that they've decided democratically uh, uh, through their their power of of, of electing legislators. How can we channel their values into our public institutions rather than just saying, you know, the public institutions, we should get rid of them, which maybe I'm amenable to the the argument in theory, uh, but in practice, um, we need to deal with what we have in front of us. Yeah, and that kind of come full circle in our conversation. That's one of the lessons to draw from this election cycle, that there were many conservative candidates for a variety of offices who were railing rightly against gender ideology and critical race theory. But to do that exclusively without the explanation of what shall replace it, what that's going to look like, 
was not a political winner. And you know the, the, the shorthand for this, which you, you've used a couple of times, is there has to be a vision for the future, a, a policy vision, but also an aspirational vision for self-governance. The good news is that a majority of Americans are still there. We've seen that because of election results. So oh, we're really just getting started, but I'll just ask you a, a couple <laughs> yeah. final questions, and then we'll have you back sure. many times over the years. Yeah. Uh, the, the next question is one that I often ask at the beginning of a conversation, but you and I just launched into what's been a great conversation because of you, Chris. Some people may not know how you got into doing what you're doing. And and the Southerner in me is always very interested in someone's story. So <laughs> you're a filmmaker, make some great documentaries. You are one of the policy leaders, one of the intellectual leaders of this generation of the conservative movement. And so I thank you for that. But why? How did that happen? Yeah, I, I probably have a maybe uh, non-traditional story. Uh, I wasn't That's why I want a, you to tell I, it. I wasn't a young Republican. Uh, I didn't go to Hillsdale. Uh, I, I don't have the, the 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 kind of typical story. And and I think that. Um, in a way, I can. That's why maybe I can see things a bit differently, see opportunities that others don't. But uh, I grew up in California. My father's an immigrant from Italy. My mom is uh, from Detroit, uh, and uh, and uh, I grew up left wing. I, I mean, really, through my teenage years, through college years, um, you know, I mean, le left wing, left wing. I, I I tell the story. You know, my my aunts and uncles in Italy are all uh, members of the uh, unreconstructed communist left. I mean, the the. It's called the Democratic Party of the Left, but it's the communist, it's the reformulated Communist Party in Italy. And so I remember going even as a teenager visiting my aunts and uncles, and uh, they would show me the, the collected works of Lenin. I mean, you know, as and and uh, I've read those books. Yeah, at no time I liked them. I thought, this is great. Uh, and you know, they gave me a Che Guevara flag for my 12th birthday or something, you know, that I had in my room. And so I I know intimately from my own eyes, kind of my own experience, my own beliefs. That, that entire world, um, uh, that ideology, that culture in, in a lot of ways, you know, grew up in California. And, uh, and then as I got older, that started to break down um, for two reasons. One, because I realized uh, uh, in college here in, in D.C. at Georgetown, my undergraduate degree, um, getting involved in, in left-wing politics, it's like, these people are phonies. Your dad is the CEO of some, you know, manufacturing company, and you're out here doing a hunger strike for the the Bhutan or what? I don't even know what you're doing. This is this is a farce. This is a Tom Wolfe novel. You people are ridiculous. And I had, I just, it, it kind of fell apart for me, just personally, aesthetically, socially. Like, no, this isn't, uh, um, th th this isn't, this isn't the right. This is a, a totally phony enterprise. The kind of elite left wing culture in the United States. And so that was the first thing. Like, well, I got to get away from these people. These people are, are 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 no good. And then I worked as a documentary filmmaker, directed films for PBS, for Netflix, other other TV stations. I traveled to dozens of countries around the world. And that's really where things really change. It's like, oh, wait a minute. I'm kind of seeing how other societies work, how other governing systems work, how other constitutions work. Oh, we have the absolutely the best one. Uh, right back in the United States. Well, why is that? What works, what doesn't work? And then I started doing my own kind of line of independent study, reading all the, the books, tracing them back, reading the conservative books that I didn't read before and saying, oh, wow, this now starts to track with my own observation. So it was first almost an intellectual thing. And then you get older, you have kids. Um, and then it really becomes, the stakes are much higher. And then you say, oof, um, what are those things that actually work, that, that create good people, that create happy people, high-functioning people? What are the ideas that can actually bring us up towards something higher, something truly better, you know? So out with the Lenin books, out with the you know the Che Guevara. It's, a good start. I, 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 it's like oh my gosh! And then you read the actual record of those things. You're like, it, you know, I lived in China for a year, so it's like making a film. It's like oh, that's what communism does. This is not good. Uh, so so it was this gradual process, and then um, and then in my kind of 30s, I had a, a kind of career crisis. I think kind of mentioned it like oh, what I'm doing every day doesn't matter. Uh, this is this is bad. And and then the documentary industry was kind of proto-woke. I mean, it, it started going woke 10 years ago. 
uh, and it was an early adopter. And I saw the writing on the wall. I said, "All right, I, I got to jump ship. This is this is a, a, a ship that is a." Uh, is, is sinking fast. And as the uh, the white male, uh, I, I'm going to be thrown overboard imminently. You will be the first. I, I, I will be the first uh, thrown off the ship. And so I said, uh, you know, because the, the racial and sexual politics, it, that's what it is. That's that's kind of how it worked. And uh, and so, and, and I had this passion for politics that I didn't know what to do with because my ideas as a younger person, um, my politics just oh, evaporated. And then as I studied into it and transferred some of my documentary making skills, my journalistic skills, um, and then I said, you know, I'm actually going to be uh, 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 more honest in what I believe. And so I made a film that was conservative. Um, and then I was blackballed from the documentary world, complete, I mean, explicitly and completely. Even people would tell me, I can no longer work with you. I've heard you're conservative. I mean, people that I've worked with for many is years. Is that bad? Is that bad? Yeah. And, and, in, and in a sense, fine. I mean, at, at the time it hurt, but in a sense, looking back, actually, thank God, really. Oh, fantastic. They gave me the, the kick in the ass that I needed to get out the door. And then I started connecting with, with, uh, with conservatives, which was kind of weird for me at first. It was a bit, a bit strange. I did the Claremont Fellowship and, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, Ryan, the president over there at Claremont, actually, uh, I applied for the Claremont Fellowship. He called me on the phone. He said, hey, your resume isn't quite what we get usually. I'm an, I want to know that you're not a plant. You're not a kind of James O'Keefe of the I left. I see Ryan you know? Lynch asking this question. And I said, uh, I said, fair play, you know, and, and we talked and, he, and I had done the reading. So, you know, so it was fine. And then, and then, and then connected with, with Heritage, with Manhattan Institute, with all these great um, intellect, kind of intellectual movement. And for me, that was the exciting, George Gilder, huge influence on me. I worked at Discovery Institute for a few years uh, uh, under kind of George's tutelage. And we have a rich intellectual subculture that I had not, I, I had not seen until my kind of mid to late 20s. I had no idea it existed. It's kind of hidden from you. And, and as I just read, 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 it's like, this is where I want to be. This is exciting. This is actually transgressive now, unfortunately. Um, but but this is the the tradition, the lineage, the intellectual uh, uh, um, uh, transmission that I want to be a part of. And so um, that that's what got me into it. And that's what now that I finally found at home, really, pe like-minded people um, pursuing the same kind of vision. It's like there's nothing better than that feeling. When you're clicked in with people, you're working towards something productive, you're in the trenches with them, you're fighting for the same thing. You have the same set of references, um, uh, the same set of, of beliefs, th th little differences. But um, to me, that's exciting. That, that, that is what is, uh, that's what gives me up every day. That's what drives me. Yeah. What, a lot of lessons in that wonderful response. One of them that strikes me is a great, ex you offered a great explanation of how being moored to our principles, the permanent things, informs the activism of being on offense, being in the trenches. These, these work hand in hand. And so the last question I have for you, you offered a perfect lead-in to the last question is, for a listener, someone watching this who's been kind of despairing since election results in November, maybe concerned about the culture, Maybe concerned because we, you and I, hit on institutions pretty hard. That the road ahead is narrow. What hopefulness? What reason for hopefulness would you give them? R remember um, where you actually live your life. This is something that I try to do because I have a weird, very postmodern life in a lot of ways. I engage in kind of media combat, journalism, abstract debate, um, uh, and, and so I, I live that life. Um, but I always try to remember every day that in, in a sense, it's fake. I mean, it, it, it's fake. I mean, it's real, it's meaningful, but in a sense, it is abstracted from your actual day-to-day -day life because of the nature of how media and technology works. But, but you, you have to remember who are the people you spend the most time with? Who are, where are the institutions that matter in your local community? What are the, who are the, you know, what are you doing with your, your kids every day? Um, you know, where do you go to church? What, what is, what grocery store do you shop at? Even very mundane, prosaic things. Where do you actually live your life? 
And so if you're engaged in politics, what that means in a mass society, mass communications environment, is that you're engaged in, 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 in a kind of media world, which reflects reality, but it's also a distortion of reality just by the nature of how it works. So always ground yourself in the people around you and remember that in those things, um, uh, uh, that's where you live your life, that's where you can have influence, that's where you're not powerless. You actually have the, the tremendous power and influence. So root into that. If there's something, if there are things that are not working in those connections, relationships, institutions, change them because you can. And then when you have that together, when you have when you're when you're feeling optimistic, because those are the things that fuel you from a day-to-day -day basis, then go back out and fight for some of the things that are a bit further afield. Um, and, and, and then support your fighters, support your champions, you know, uh, support people like me, support people like the staff at, at, at Heritage that are fighting that more abstract fight on your behalf. But, but remember that, that your life and the life of people is still good in this country. I, I'm optimistic. I, I think that people are scared, people are worried, fe people feel besieged. Um, we, we have to work on creating barriers and protections for people, pushing that stuff back. Um, but people have to ultimately take ownership of their own day-to-day -day life in, as, as it's lived in, in, in that organic, flesh-and-blood way. And so I think always remember um, that, okay, this is where I live. This is what I do. This is the, 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 these are the people and the institutions around me. And I think that, that's where you have to draw that sustenance. And, um, and then be honest with yourself. Uh, 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 it, it, I think... For most people, if they actually say, well, actually, when I think about it, those things are all good still. And, and they're not perfect. They need protection. They need reform. But, but I, I just say start there um, because you can rage about what happens in D.C. And I, I do. You do. I'm <laughs> even more than I do. Um, but, but for most people, I, I think it's really about, in some ways, a, 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 a retreat. As some of us are, are charging the barricades. I think that the, the, the thing that we have to also do is, in a sense, retreat to our own, our, our own organic lives. Um, and, uh, and then some of us, and I, I think we've talked about this too, is some of us have to do both. Uh, it's very confusing uh, sometimes, but, but y you have to do it. Um, and I think even for our friends who are in the kind of policy sphere, media sphere, political sphere, elected sphere, in, in some ways it's almost more important for them to do the same. Otherwise, you kind of get caught in, in, in the image, in the spectacle, and you mistake it for your actual life. There's a lot of that that goes on, yeah. and uh, what, a, what a tremendous set of, of recommendations. So, Chris Rufo, thanks for joining me. Good to be here. And thanks so much for what you're doing. So, I know you enjoy that conversation as much as I did. We, we can guarantee that Chris will be one of our return guests. Thanks for making The Kevin Roberts Show possible. If you've not yet given us a rating, you know, this the one part of socialism we like is just five-star ratings. So please do that. In all seriousness, keep your chin up. We're going to take back this country, and we'll be back with you soon. Take care.